Good evening, welcome. I'm uh, Nicholas Brash, Director of Melbourne Jewish Book Week, and I'd like to start by acknowledging that we meet tonight on the lands of the First Nations people, and I'll pay my respect to Elders past, present, and emerging, and to any uh, with us here tonight. Welcome to the second Tuesday of the month, now ingrained in your mind, no doubt, as Melbourne Jewish Book Week evening. Uh, before I introduce our two panellists, I just want to thank um, Melbourne Jewish Book Week's major sponsors, uh, the Crystal Found Sunraiser Foundation, Gandalf Philanthropy, and the Australian Jewish News. And, and I particularly want to note the support of the Australian Jewish News, um, that they, the support they've given us in promoting and partnering with us in these monthly events. Uh, to everyone at the AJN, your support is very much appreciated. Tonight we have our very first book club event, uh, and I'm thrilled to be able to say we've got over 250 registrations for tonight. So uh, everyone watching tonight, is a, uh, you're in good company and large company. Um, and tonight we feature our very own Bram Presser, who will be talking to Julia Reedon about her profoundly moving the writing on the wall. As a book club event, uh, as opposed to uh, a regular interview, we're going to be inviting your questions from the, from the beginning. What I ask is that you, um, if you have a question um, uh, for Juliet, um, for Bram to ask Juliet, please uh, post them in the Q&A section, which you'll find down the bottom of your screen. Um, and uh, Bram will get through as many of them as possible. Uh, noting, of course, that we do have a large number of people. We're not going to get through them all. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get through as many as we can. I'll be back at the end of uh, the conversation uh, to preview some upcoming events. So please don't log off immediately. Uh, but in the meantime, now, Bram, um, you can unmute yourself and over to you. Okay. Ah, oh, there we go. The unmuting did not work initially and I started with panic. Uh, hi everyone and, and welcome to the first ever uh, Melbourne Jewish Book Week book club. Uh, very excited to have everyone uh, here, as Nick said, uh, we're welcoming your questions. So there's a field where you can you can put in your questions. I'll be watching that, and um, I will be answering. Uh, and well, Juliet will be answering uh, uh, your questions as well as mine. Um, now, I would like to, on that note, welcome uh, Juliet Reedon, who, as Nick said, has written this uh, remarkable, uh, beautiful, deeply personal uh, book, "The Writing on the Wall." Um, Juliet is a, a distinguished journalist, a, 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 a editor at large of the Australian Women's Weekly, a royal correspondent who would have thunk. Um, uh, but yes, as I said, uh, for, for, for tonight, uh, the author of The Writing on the, on the Wall, which I'm hoping uh, a lot of you have read uh, already and will be able to uh, ask questions from uh, what uh, you uh, got from the book and, and questions you have of Juliet. Um, from reading the book. Um, so welcome, Juliet, firstly. Are you unmuted? I'm no, you're still muted. Oh, you are. There you go. I'm muted. Excellent. Uh, welcome to Melbourne Jewish Book Week Book Club. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, pleasure. Thank you for having me. So let, let's, let's just go back, back to the beginning. As I said, a lot of people will have read the book. Um, uh, I imagine a few won't have. Um, but Let's go back to the beginning because this book really came about in, I would say, quite an un unusual way. Um, so could you uh, take us back to, the, to your uh, stepping into the Pinker Synagogue in Prague? Yes, so I was in Prague on a stopover on the way back from England. I'm from England originally. My family lived there. I was over there um, visiting family and uh, taking my partner to uh, Czechoslovakia and to Prague for the first time, um, knowing that, you know, this was where my father was from. And uh, we went to the Pincus Synagogue. Now, um, I had been there before, um, but I hadn't realised that there was anything to do with me in the Pincus Synagogue. And we were walking through the Pincus Synagogue, which is now a memorial for all of the victims of the Holocaust from um, Bohemia and Moravia. And along the walls of the Pinker Synagogue are the names of all those victims drawn with their date of birth and, and presumed date of death. Um, and it's, it's collected in different, different areas and uh, different parts of uh, Czechoslovakia as it was then. And uh, 
I was walking around and, you know, just got to the R's and there was reading on the wall. Now, when I was growing up in England, we were the only readings. There were no other readings at all. Perhaps in Prague, where my father's from, there would be readings. <coughs> but I looked at these readings on the wall and um, I, I felt something, something really grabbed hold of me. It was really chilling. And um, I, I, I almost couldn't stand up because I had this sense that they were something to do with me. And as we do now, I had my phone with me, I tapped their names mm -hmm. in and almost immediately I discovered that yes, these, these were my relatives and these were relatives I did not know had existed. So that was the start of my journey. And did, did you decide at that point that, that, that you had to find out this story? Like this was, this was something that had been, um, I suppose, missing from your, certainly your childhood um, and obviously, uh, you know, a large part of your adult life as well. Um, was like, was like, could you, maybe if you could, um, explain like the, 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 what, what made you actually just right pursue it, need to pursue it, um, to like, like particularly to the extent that you did. Yeah. Well, I, I was perplexed to start with because, um, my father was an only child. Um, I was always told my father was an only child. He was raised in Prague. I knew that he had left Prague at the age of eight and managed to escape. Sent, he was sent on a mission called the Barbican Mission to the Jews, which was an airlift from Prague of 68 Jewish children to save them from Hitler. I knew that. I knew my grandparents were sent to Theresienstadt concentration camp and survived. And my family story, as far as I knew, was that unlike so many other uh, Jews from Czechoslovakia, my family were the lucky ones. Um, my grandparents had, had gone to this concentration camp, which I was led to believe wasn't too bad. And then they had come out the other side. And although there may have been some very distant relatives who were killed, uh, that was it, largely that nothing else happened. And then suddenly I discovered that I had relatives and that these relatives were my father's uncles and aunts. They were his grandfather. Um, and later I found out even there were even more relatives, um, all in the same generation. Um, so they were all people that he knew and he never once mentioned them. Now, when oh, I was growing up, oh. I longed for relatives because my father was an only child. My mother, coincidentally from Australia, was also an only child. So I had no cousins and I longed for cousins. And um, it, in my mind now, I was thinking, oh my God, I may have cousins, I may have family, and this is just the start. Surely someone here will be living. So tell me, um, you, you, you knew a, a quite a, or at least some of his story, but tell, tell us a bit about your father as you knew him. Um, um, you know, what, what, what sort of, given you didn't know his background at that time, or the, you know, the, 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 the extent of, of the various aspects of his, of his background. Um, what, what was your relationship like? Um, what, you know, what did he let you in on? What didn't he? I, I was very close to my father. He had, um, my parents had three children. I was the youngest and the only girl and possibly rather spoilt and uh, definitely the apple of my father's eye. And, um, uh, we we uh, loved doing things together. I felt I knew my father very well. He was a quiet man. He was a gentle man. He was incredibly generous and giving um, in everything he did. Uh, he was a, a, a confirmed socialist. Um, he he was uh, non-judgmental, totally non-judgmental. He wasn't a religious man either. And um, he married uh, my mother, an Australian. They met on a skiing holiday, ironically, in Austria. Uh, it was a holiday romance. And they were two um, only children living in London without any family. So my, my mother's parents were in Australia. My father's parents were in Czechoslovakia. So they were, they were very much their, their own thing, you know, do, uh, having fun in the 50s and 60s in London. Um, 
I had no sense that he had this very dark past. I did, did, you, did, did you have a sense though of, of how he sort of viewed um, his, his own identity, essentially, like in terms of, um, in terms of family, in terms of um, nationality, in terms of, of you say, um, you know, he obviously wasn't a religious man, but did he, was there a sense of religion? In, in, because, I mean, and we'll get to this, but there, there's, a, there's, a, there's a degree to which he essentially grew up in two religions. Um, and you know, to to greater or lesser extents in in, in each. Yeah, my father had a, a horror of organised religion, and I never really knew where that came from. Whenever we would talk about religion in our family, because we were we were raised as as atheists, pretty much. My mother was the most confirmed atheist you would ever meet. Um, my father. I think had some sense of spirituality, but he, he hated the idea of organized religion. And I think now looking back, I can see where it came from. So he had the, the Judaism, which it wasn't, he wasn't raised very strongly in the Jewish faith, like a lot of um, Prague Jews, Jews um, that it, it wasn't a big thing, you know, they, they, they just happened to be Jewish and he didn't, he didn't go to synagogue. His father thought that he should be out in the fresh air on, on a Saturday. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, it was only later that I discovered that my grandmother, his mother, her father was a rabbi. So actually there was some, some pretty serious, uh, mm. Jews in, in our family, but certainly that never came down to my father. And when I studied Judaism at school as part of my, um, religious education, um, I knew more about Judaism than he did. So, um, <laughs> that, that was interesting. But then when he came with the Barbican mission to the Jews, who were these missionaries that uh, airlifted him out of Prague, part of the deal was that the Barbican mission would convert those children to Christianity. So they only agreed to take the children if the parents signed over that uh, wish for them to be converted. They said they wouldn't convert them till they were age 16. They said they wouldn't convert them without the parents and the child's consent, but in the end, I discovered that that didn't happen. And so I think I, I, that my father was okay. raised in this very, very strict Christian environment. I think that I, I, that that to me was, I think, probably the most challenging aspect of the book. Um, so, could you talk actually just a bit more about the Barbican mission and 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 how it came about. And because like, I think a lot of people are, are, are familiar with kinder transport. They know that, you know, um, Nikki Winton got out um, Jewish children um, uh, by train, I think it was, um, <clears throat> to England. Um, and, but, but I have to say, I'd never heard of the Barbican Mission um, until I read this book. And uh, it both, uh, it, it amazed me and it infuriated me. Yeah, um, me too. Made, makes me very angry. My father was never angry about the Barbican mission. He always said that they saved his life and he was very happy about that. And the other children, some of whom became family friends um, and are still family friends, uh, they never felt badly towards the Barbican mission. But I do feel badly towards the Barbican mission because they, their mission <coughs> About Jews to Christianity. They're part, they're now part of a group called Christian Witness Israel, which um, is a thriving organization. They're here in Australia, they're all over the world. Um, I went to their head offices in Oxford to, um, to go into their archives to look for all of the um, archive material on my father's time there. And their mission is still to convert Jews to Christianity. They believe it wholeheartedly. And it's very hard for, for me to understand. I think it's really hard for Jewish people to understand. And it was very hard for Jewish people then to understand. And they were condemned by Jews in Britain at the time. Well, I mean, this was, I mean, you know, they, they, they I got the sense that they, they, they were preying on desperation. Um, you know, what, what choice... I mean, you know, if you're if you're a parent and you you your your child's chance of survival is based on, look, I, I I'll say signing over their soul in you know inverted inverted commas, but uh, I mean, I wonder the extent to which um, 
uh, you know, you were saying that, that religion wasn't something that really mattered all that much to your grandparents. So therefore it was kind of like, well, you know, starting over, you probably won't care about that religion either. Um, and maybe that was the hope, I suppose. But, um, but, but it was, ve- it was very, um, I know, there, there was this deceitfulness to it. That it, just, it was really yeah, like to prey on. There certainly was. I mean, the, Reverend Davidson and Mrs. Davidson, who are the couple who ran this mission, Reverend Davidson actually um, was himself a Jew and then yeah. converted to Christianity. So this is where his zeal came from. He was a Polish Jew and that's where his interest in Eastern Europe came from. And he had set up an office in Poland. He had set up an office in Prague prior to um, Hitler's uh, rise and they were already established there and they were already doing their work and then as soon as Kristallnacht happened and as soon as uh, everything started going badly for Jews in Prague they were banging on you know parents were banging on his door begging him to take their children and that's when he came up this with this idea for these airlines and he actually, you know, hired, he, he um, chartered these planes. They were KLM planes. There were two planes. Must have been very expensive. Mm. Um, and I never quite got to the bottom of the financing. Of yeah. I, I, I was think a- of, the, of, the, of the whole mission was, 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 came across as quite confusing in terms of, I mean, they clearly had serious donors. Um, they must have. Serious donors. <laughs> I did go into the um, archival minutes for the... Uh, Barber Commission to the Jews in, in the Christian Witness Israel um, archives. And uh, annoyingly, they had a fire and a lot of the records were water damaged. So um, <laughs> there's, there's, a, there's both fire damage and water damage on the records, but there are a lot of donors. Essentially, Reverend, Reverend Davidson went round the country preaching. And, and literally gathered money from people as he went. I mean, the, the houses that these children lived in were donated to them. So, you know. Well, yeah, they were, these, these were beautiful manor houses. These, are, these were stunning buildings. You know, the one that they moved to during the um, Blitz, when they had to move out of London and into uh, Devon in, in England's south, um, that was a house that was was given to them for use for an, on a peppercorn rent. And it was a, a beautiful big house. So there were lots of people that were very enthralled by Reverend Davidson. And, and, and were you able to find, like, of, of the children who came on the Barbican mission, and firstly, I, another thing that I found really interesting was that um, it's, it would be, uh, I don't know, we would like to think that there's a complete separation between kinder transport, which is seen as this wholly altruistic venture of, uh, of Nicky Winton and, uh, and the Barbican mission. Um, but there was a degree to which there was some sort of linkage. There was a crossover and it was something that I discovered by chance. And I have a picture of my father getting on the plane that took him to England. It's a really, poignant picture. An incredible photo. Incredible. Incredible photo. And um, I also have a picture of my grandparents with him on that day when they got on the bus that mm. got to the plane. Um, and there, there were two um, airlifts. My father was in the second airlift, which was a week before Hitler uh, arrived in Prague. The other airlift had been in January. And on the airlift in January, there's a very famous picture that is always shown of Nicholas Winton Mm. holding a little boy. And everyone assumes that that little boy is part of the kinder transport. But Nicholas Winton is actually standing outside the plane, the first plane that went in January that was part of the Barbican mission transport. And that little boy, Hansi, is a little boy that came in in that January transport. So Nicholas Winton had something to do with it. He was helping. He, that he later in his life um, tried to separate himself mm. from the Barber Commission. And he said that when he realized that the, uh, the Barber Commission was enforcing um, conversion to Christianity, he wanted to separate himself from that. But he also said he kind of wasn't bothered either because he thought, again, 
that anyone, saving life is... anyone who is saving lives, <laughs> you know, he, I spoke to Nicholas Winton's daughter, Barbara, and she said that her father died feeling guilty. He felt guilty that he hadn't saved more children. And so, you know, another mission saving another 68 children, which is a drop in the ocean compared to the number of children that Nicholas Winton saved. Um, you know, he was all like, whatever, whatever it takes to get these children out. Um, now, I have a question here from, uh, from a, a viewer, um, which, I, which I think is, is really actually quite, quite powerful. Um, the forward to the book, um, this is from Julie, um, in, in the forward to the book, uh, Magda Shabansky says, families norm normally keep secrets for one or perhaps both of two reasons, pain and shame, um, unbearable pain, unbearable shame. So given what you know now, to what, to what um, extent do you feel um, this might have been the case um, with your father in not, in, in not uh, talking about it? Well, I have to say that when I started the journey, um, because the issue of my grandparents surviving the Holocaust, going to concentration camp and coming out of concentration camp was an issue in our household, you know, it was raised. And the, the name of Auschwitz was also raised. And um, I understood that perhaps they might have gone to Auschwitz and come back from Auschwitz, which actually wasn't the case when I looked into it. Um, and I think the name Auschwitz came up because other members of my family were murdered there. But um, I thought that my grandparents had collaborated in some way in order to save their skin during the war. And that was my, why my father refused to talk about it. So I thought it was about shame, but actually that wasn't the case. They hadn't collaborated. He knew that they hadn't. I think it was more about pain. I think my, what happened to my father's family, you know, 20 members of his family murdered. He was eight years old when he left his parents. He never saw his father again. He saw his mother once. Um, these are horrifying things to happen to a little boy. He came to England on his own and he then, you know, had to speak a foreign language all of a sudden and he was put into the English school system. He was a bright boy and got a scholarship into the English private school system. So he was separated again from all those yeah. children from his homeland. And I think he just didn't want to share any of that pain. I think he didn't want to spread it through his family. He wanted us separate from it. Was, it, was there a sense of, of that he had like a really particular kind of survivor's guilt almost, um, having escaped uh, firstly um, the Nazis, secondly, kind of the Barbican mission in a way he sort of escaped. Um, and he, he kind of was propelled forward to a like a, a, a reasonable life, um, you know, whilst his, what would have been his cousins and, uh, or, or, or his uncles and aunts and what have you, all died. Yeah, I think he, he had a very complicated relationship with his parents because there's no question that he felt very hurt that they didn't come and get him after the war. You know, here he was in the Barbican mission. Most of the children there, their parents were killed. Uh, they were orphans after the yeah. war. And my father fully expected to go back to Prague and live with his parents. And that didn't happen. And I think he was, he was very hurt by that. Um, but then I think he also felt guilty because he realised the pain they were in. They, they wrote, I saw the letters that they wrote to the Barber Commission because I found those in my father's archival file. They must have written letters like that to my father, but yeah. in more detail explaining why they weren't coming to get him. My father always quoted the words, you're an Englishman now. It's not good to be a Czech Jew anymore. You, you need to cut off. And he always quoted that, that he was an Englishman now. And he actually sounded really English. You know, lots of the other children in the Barbican mission who then became my sort of mock aunts and, and uncles as, as I um, grew up, 
they had very heavy Eastern European accents. My father did not. My father sounded like a uh, public school boy. <laughs> boy. And uh, you, you could not tell where he came from by listening to how he spoke. And uh, certainly he did become an Englishman. With regards to survivor's guilt, I did talk to him about writing letters. He said that the Barber Commission made them write a letter every, uh, every month to their families. Now, after the first couple of years, those letters would, wouldn't have gone anywhere, oh, but, yeah. um, but they were supposed to write the letters. And my dad said, who, my dad, who was a terrible letter writer, he hated writing letters, <laughs> said he always felt really guilty because he didn't, he didn't know what to say. And um, he, he didn't feel that he'd, he'd uh, done enough writing the letters. So, you know, I think perhaps there was a little bit of guilt there that he, he felt he should have looked after his parents a bit better. But, um, you know. I think your, uh, your, your, your grandparents to me, uh, I think were in some ways the most uh, confounding uh, people in the book. Um, uh, could you maybe talk about their, their, their survival first? Because I, I know that as you were saying, you initially thought they collaborated. And um, I think a lot of people, um, you know, it, it's, very, it's very hard to, to, to understand the survival of their families. Um, and I think that's a, a very, very common for, for, for descendants of Holocaust survivors. Um, and um, your grandparents stayed in Theresienstadt through the entire war. Um, and we actually had quite a, a very similar um, uh, uh, path to inquiry on this uh, in terms of trades and stuff. Um, so could you talk about, about what you did find? Because I think your, your grandfather's case was, was quite uh, strange um, and, and very, uh, yeah, not, not one that's spoken of or heard of much. Yes, yeah, so what I discovered was that my grandfather was indeed protected. Now, I had assumed he was protected because he uh, was either part of that council of the elders. My grandfather worked for the Czech government. Um, he was quite high up. He had a very good job. He was a lawyer by trade. And um, I assumed that that gave him some elevated place within the structure of Theresienstadt and you know there was the Jewish Council of Elders who were the ones who chose who went on the transport and who didn't. So I had always assumed that that was his protection but it actually wasn't. His protection was because he served for the Austrian army in the First World War and um, he didn't just serve for the Austrian army, he was highly decorated. Um, he lost his leg in, in that war um, and, you know, he was 21 when he went to war. He was very young. Uh, he obviously fought very bravely. He got two, two highly uh, commended medals, uh, which I think I have, actually. I found them the other day and realised, gosh, those are the medals, um, which I never realised, again, something my father kept but never, never told us about. And I found them in an old box. Um, but uh, that the, the Germans were strange creatures and they, um, they wanted to, they gave protection to those who had fought for them in the, in the First World War. And they gave protection to veterans. Now my grandfather was quite obviously a veteran because he had lost his leg. So he immediately went into this protected state in Theresienstadt. He was allowed, his wife was always also protected, but that's where the protection ended. So even though the rest of his family and the rest of my grandmother's family all came through Theresienstadt, most of them left Theresienstadt too and were sent to the East and killed in, in all sorts of horrific ways. Um, how did you feel about um, interrogating a silence that, that your father had, um, like, had specifically sought? Um, like, it's, do, you, do you feel this is a story he would have wanted you to pursue? Probably not, if I'm completely honest. Um, you know, my, I, I did, you know, I'm, I'm a journalist. I did question my father a little bit as much as I could um, and I got nowhere with it and realized quite quickly that there was, there was something in there 
some darkness in there that wasn't going to come out. Um, but equally, all of the other uh, Holocaust survivors that I knew, which were the other children from the uh, Barb Commission to the Jews who, who were friends of our family, they didn't talk about it either. Nobody, nobody talked about it, you know, and, and that is very common. But I did feel anxious about um, uncovering this stuff. I really did. And I think, I think what propelled me on was just the need to know who these people were. Um, you know, there was, there's one um, of my father's aunts, um, Ida, who we had a picture of in our family album. And he, she had written him a beautiful postcard when he was at school. So this was after he left Prague, while she, just, just before she was killed, as I found out. She'd written my father a postcard saying, we haven't forgotten you and we're all thinking of you. Um, and she, he had never mentioned this woman, but this woman was in our photograph album. And there was not one time when he said, that's Auntie Ida. And um, I was desperate to know Auntie Ida because I'd grown up with her. I'd grown up with her in my photo album. I didn't know who she was, but I'd grown up with her. So, you know, and then when I discovered that my grandmother's side of the family was so huge that she was one of 11 and that they were all so impressive and prolific, I just, I just needed to know them. And I, I think it was a duty to tell their story as well. I felt, I felt it was really awful that my family didn't know what had happened to our family and that these people were ciphers to us. I, I found it really um, quite uh, both, both disturbing and moving to look at um, the family trees that are in your, in your book um, and how many of them, the end date is 1942 or 1943. And, I, you know, from someone who grew up feeling they came from a tiny family, right? You actually have this this huge, huge family that was wiped out. Um, now, do you want to tell us maybe a bit? Because I, I I felt there was also like a sense of that you were you were you were give, bringing them to the fore so that they they can be remembered. Uh, like it seems that there's a a very important uh, a kind of almost a duty to to reclaim the names um, to uh, uh, so that so that uh, these people shouldn't just be a number, they should be people. They should be remembered as family. Um, were there any particular ones that you felt or that I either particularly surprised you or you felt particularly close with um, in 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 seeing them? Yeah, I mean, I ended up getting pretty close to all of them, I have to say. Um, and a lot, of, a lot of what I discovered was filling in the gaps of their story and then using my imagination because, you know, the, the detail is, is scant. Although as I dug further, the detail got more and more and more, you know, when I went into the archives in Prague and, and started, had the full names and the full dates of birth, and then I could find them more. And, um, and I would sort of get cross if I, if I couldn't find things I felt I should be able to find, um, like my, uh, my father's grandmother's grave. I wanted to find that and I was told it was there and then it wasn't there and I felt like, I was being cheated somehow and there was um there was some conspiracy against me um but ida definitely i connected with um very much uh she was obviously very close to my grandmother the, there are lots of pictures of them together um and uh you know she was she was shot naked in a wood it's, it's a horrible horrible yeah. story it and really, the picture of her is, is, you know, this quite cool, like um, very, elegant, kind of fun, lively woman. Yeah, like, absolutely. And then the other one, uh, you know, Eliska Hoffer, um, who had an illegitimate child, Vera, who I believe had an illegitimate child, Vera, who was three years old and who was sent to Auschwitz and stayed in the family camp there and was one of those people, I think we all know the story of the family camp where they had to write the postcards out to someone saying, it's lovely here, we're fine. Um, yeah. And then she and 
baby Vera, well, three-year-old Vera, were gassed, that, that um, image will stay with me uh, ever, most definitely. Um, yeah, quite. I, I've, I, that actually, <clears throat> that, that really hit me too, because um, the likelihood is she will have, they will have been gassed with my grandfather's mother, um, who was also in the family camp and uh, also died in the liquidation of the family camp. Um, I, I have a question just here. Oh, sorry. This part was sent mm -hmm. to my grandmother in Teresian stat. So, you know, because that was her only relative. So it's, it's you know, that would, it, it's horrifying to think that all of that was, was going on. But yeah. the other thing, I, I, I really liked them. I got to really like yes, them. Yes, I, I, I certainly got that sense. Bunch. And, you know, I, what really, really surprised me was that there were so, so few had children. There were, there were so many that didn't seem to either marry or have children. Now, either there was some big cover up and they weren't wanting to put children's names on documents, or I think it was more likely that they were just part of the modern generation, going out there, getting, having jobs, living, yeah. having fun, <laughs> enjoying um, Prague life. It was, a, it was a very Czech thing of that time, from what I, from what I understand as well. I have a question here just from uh, uh, someone who is, is watching, from um, uh, Larry and Helen Light. Just back a, a question about the Barbican kids. Um, mm -hmm. Were they all converted? Did they all become Christian? Um, and did, 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 that, um, did that influence the, uh, the, the, their silence about their past, do you feel? Um, I don't know whether all of them were converted because I don't have the archives of every single child. Some of them were destroyed. But in the archives are a bunch of baptisms and most of them seem to have been converted. You know, they, as I say, they were supposed to wait until they were 16. My father was converted at 14, 13, going on 14. Um, you, you were supposed to ask the parents. My grandparents were interagents that by then. So yeah, yeah. There's no way they were asked. Um, lots of them, uh, well, there, there were a few who became very fervent Christians. And in my father's case, I know because he was bright and because he got this scholarship to a uh, private school, um, Reverend Davidson wanted him to work in the Barbican mission. He, he was training him to become a minister. And he said that he would pay for him to go to university to study theology. And my father went on with, went along with that for quite a while, and then at the last minute said, "No, actually, I want to do geography." And the Reverend Davidson said, "Well, therefore, we won't pay." But but interestingly, though, your father seems to have kept a relationship with with the Davidsons because um, they were at uh, your parents' wedding. Yeah, well, um, Mrs. Davidson. Sorry, Mrs. Sorry, she, he, yeah, he I don't was dead, think, I think Reverend Davidson was, but yes, he wrote to Reverend Davidson and Mrs. Davidson. He definitely saw them as as parental figures, hmm. um, but you know, he had no one. That's the that's the sadness about my father that he was really very alone. And um, my father was such a family man with us. We were everything to him, and I realize why now because he suffered so badly himself in not having those connections and um i think yes he saw he saw mrs davidson as his his surrogate mother and reverend davidson was a man he looked up to so i don't think there was there was no abuse that went on it was a it was a warm and loving environment albeit proselytizing yes. for five seconds and very religious but, you know, a lot of them did not become Christians. You know, my mm. aunt Annalisa would not call herself a Christian. My, um, this is my fake aunt and my fake yeah, yeah. <laughs> who, were, who were brother and sister in the mission, who I still know and I still, um, I still talk to. But neither of them um, became Christian. So, um, you know, people did leave it if they, if they wanted to. Um, knowing as you came to learn what happened to your family, to the, to the extended family, um, what, uh, you visited Theresienstadt, you visited Auschwitz. Um, and I'm wondering, as someone who, who well, hadn't, hadn't visited Theresienstadt before and didn't think that Auschwitz actually figured in their story before, um, how it felt to go to those places? 
it, it was very emotional for me. Um, it, it was a very strange feeling, it really was. Um, I, I was determined to walk in the footsteps of my relatives as much as I could and to find out as much as I could about them. And I used every ounce of my journalistic skills to do that. Um, and that meant being very forensic and quite brutal uh, with my own emotions um, when I went to these places. Um, and I, I found it very uh, chilling, very heartbreaking. It, uh, the, the feeling of going there and, you know, Theresienstadt is, is quite a pretty place. It's yeah, it's gorgeous. A beautiful, beautiful town. Inside. There were birds singing. There were, there were wildflowers popping up through the grass. Um, the architecture is quite pretty. And... I felt, it felt so wrong to me, you know, and I was looking at these flowers and I was looking at the, at the river thinking, this is where my relative's ashes probably are. And these are mm. the flowers that were, were growing when, when they were suffering here. And, and it, it really does fill your head so much. Um, and Auschwitz is just such a strange place. It, it yeah. really is. Um, so huge, so much bigger than I had imagined, and yet so close to the town, which yeah. is deeply, deeply shocking. That's kind of shocking, yeah, very. The idea that everyone around knew exactly what was going on, even though they claimed they didn't. You couldn't yeah. know what was going on there. So, so the, the, the horror of what was done there and how many people were involved with what was done really struck me hard and made me feel very differently about um about the nazis about the whole about the whole war about how many people were involved you know it wasn't just one egotistical mad evil yeah. very evil man it it was a lot of people who knew <coughs> what they were doing and presumably thought what they were doing was right, was right. Mm. Um, that that was very shocking to me. I have a, another question from from um, one of the I'll call them a book club member, as we we now all are. Um, with you, um, relating to uh, Auschwitz as a as a memorial, so you 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 say uh, about that you know two roughly two million people. Uh, you actually say two million tourists, which is essentially what they are, um, visit Auschwitz uh, each year, um, and it sounds like a kind of a strange there's a there's a there's a it grates to put those two words together doesn't it um but um do you have any thoughts um on how auschwitz and and the holocaust in 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 general um could be memorialized to the world outside and how you sustain the impact having been there right? like um how do you how do you keep it um like present uh well, actually, I think the Auschwitz Memorial do a, do a pretty good job. I had quite a lot to do with the archivists there, and they were, they were very helpful to me. Um, they, they have a, um, a Twitter thing where they post a different person every day who died in Auschwitz, who was murdered in Auschwitz, a picture of them and a little bit about their story. And I... I retweet that pretty much every day and I'm you know I know that one day one of those people will be my relatives and it does keep it very much in your mind when you see the pictures it's the pictures all the time I mean when I was in Auschwitz and when I was in Theresienstadt like everyone going through there who had some connection to it I was scouring the walls trying to see if I could see my relatives staring yeah. back you know most of them I I didn't really know what they looked like, but I felt like I would recognize them if I saw them. And um, I, I feel like, yeah, they, I think the Auschwitz Memorial does do quite a good job. Um, a question that, that's actually come up now from about four or five people. How did your, fam how did your siblings feel about this, uh, this search of yours? And how, have, how has your family reacted? And have readers reacted, um, particularly ones uh, with whom the story would resonate and they might contact you um, with similar stories or questions uh, arising? Yeah. 
I've been inundated with um, people writing letters to me, people sending me their stories, people calling me, people emailing me. Nearly all of them are um, either survivors themselves or family members of survivors. And, you know, I've told, I've told a few of their stories myself uh, journalistically since then, because every single story you come across is unique and different and shocking and amazing. And of course, because most of them come from survivors, there's a wonderful survival story in there as well. Um, with regards to my family, it's been very interesting. So I have two elder brothers. They did help me a little bit with the family research um, uh, at their, on their end, but they found it very uh, upsetting, I think, um, reading the book. My youngest brother still hasn't read the book. Really? My eldest brother read it and uh, said that, uh, he, he commended me on the book, but said that he, um, he, didn't, he didn't see things in quite the same way as I did. He didn't, he didn't, he didn't realize that I felt a lack of relatives, for instance. Um, so he didn't know that. He said he didn't. He felt that we were a perfect um, family and didn't need anybody else. Um, and I think he probably felt that maybe I was criticised <laughs> brothers huh? um, in, in that they weren't enough or something. But um, uh, my younger brother definitely, he's not, he's the elder of my he's the younger of my two elder brothers. I always call him my baby brother, but he's not. Um, <laughs> he um, has definitely found it very confronting. And uh, as I say, he hasn't read it. His wife has read it and was very uh, tearful about it because she knew my father. Um, you know, there, there's one particular scene in the book which continually comes back to me when I look at that photograph. And that was on my father's deathbed. He said he was, quite delirious from, he had cancer and he was quite delirious from the drugs. He was on morphine and things. And he sat up in bed after a particularly bad night when we thought he was going to die. And he actually died the following day. And all of us were around his bed at home. And he, he sat up and he said, the plane is in the hangar to my eldest brother. And we all know now that he was talking about that plane. That plane yeah. never talked to us. Uh, it, it, when I read it, I got chills. When you say it, I got I get chills again. Like it was, it's just like once you, when you know the story, like to to think that that's what he went back to in his kind of final moments uh, was incredibly powerful and and, and moving. And yeah, it's it, chills. You know. Yeah. Um, I mean, that was the plane that took him away from his homeland, away from his parents, that saved his life. But yeah. Uh, but it's the it's the thing he remembered on on his deathbed uh, and had never spoken to us any of us before about it. Um, it very interesting question here. Um, are you glad that you only found out the full story after he died? I could never have found out the story before he died because I would never have investigated it. But uh, let. <laughs> Let's let's say you could, you know, you know what I mean. Like like no, I mean I, I actually had a similar question uh, prepared, which was was um, if you could ask him things now, you know what what would you say? What would you say to him? I would ask him what those people were like. I want to know. You know, they lived with him. They lived in his house. I want to know what that day was like when when he left. Um, Prague? Did they have a party? You know, they knew he was going the next day. Um, all of his relatives were running around trying to get visas to go all over the place. Um, I want to get some sense of all of that history. Um, I, I would love to know all about that. I would love to know so much more about what went on in Prague. I mean, interestingly, when we, he and I did go back to Prague together, I have never seen him relax so much. Mm. He just suddenly became a Czech. Um, so mus muscle memory sort of thing. His Czech came back, um, even though he hadn't spoken it since he was eight years old. And, and he knew his way around, you know, we were staying in this hotel and we got on the tram and went to his flat. 
um, astonishing. Was, was that the one in um, Sudamerska? Yeah. So that, that was around the corner from, uh, from where my grand, grandparents lived. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're a Jishko family as well. Um, <laughs> so I, that, by the way, I found that part really interesting. Your, the visit to that house, uh, this was not, this was, you know, on, on this current, on, on the journey, not with your dad, um, when uh, the, the woman wouldn't let you in. Yes. Um, so I was there with my, I hired a, a researcher um, because I don't speak Czech. And um, he came with me and he took me around to all the different, uh, we found all the different homes of all of my family. And we went around Prague finding them where they'd moved from. And, and we found my father's flat, which was indeed the flat that my father had taken me to before. And um, we rang on the doorbell. There was, uh, he looked down for Czech names on the, on the door, um, on the, uh, the, Keypad. The buzzer thing, yeah. Yeah, and he buzzed in, and this old lady answered, and uh, he said, "Were you living here then?" And she said, "Yes, I was, what, four years old or something." And he said, "Oh, well, you you will know the Reedens because they were living there then." Um, and she said, "No, no, 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 no Reedens living there." And, and and Julius said to her, well, "No, you re you really will know the Reedens because." They were Jewish and they were removed from there. So, so you would have you would have known that. And he and um, this this lady's father would have been, you know, around your age, and, and you would have played together. And, and she said, no, no, no readers lived here. No readers lived here. And and Julie said, well, can we at least come up and have a look? Because you know she's come all the way from Australia. She wants to see what her father's flat looked like. And she put the phone down and wouldn't let us in. It's interesting. I, I actually wondered when I read that whether you would have gotten a different response had someone from two generations below answered the buzzer. You know what I mean? Like I, I got, I, I got that feeling that you know there's that the classic thing of of people fearing that the Jews are coming back to take back their their property. That's exactly what I think she did fear, um, most certainly. And my father had a similar experience. They had a house in the mountains that he never found, and he went back to try and find. And when he was looking for it with my mother, they went to the village that he recognised where he thought their house was and started asking around and they, were, they immediately shut him off. Wow. Shut him off. Now, another question that, that, that I've got here um, from, from a viewer. Um, how do you think the journey has changed you? Um, it's changed my... Uh, opinion of my father it's made me miss my father a lot I have to say it it really was a in in many ways I think um, one of the other reasons that I got so involved with it and I um, put so much into it was because I, I it was bringing my father back to me and um, he was living with me uh, all, all the way through so it was kind of lovely to have him around for that time um, and this has made me understand so much more about who he was and about what an amazing man he was. Um, yeah. Also what an amazing wife he had in, in my mother supporting him because he did go through some quite dark periods of depression, um, which you know we would now <clears throat> think were PTSD for sure. And um, my mum always pulled him out of it. And, and they stayed, they were such a rock solid couple. And um, it really has made me put them on a pedestal that I know they would hate to be on. <laughs> <laughs> but they, they are on that pedestal for me. And, it, and it's quite, I mean, I know it's very romantic and possibly a bit sentimental, but it's quite a nice place for me to view them from. Yeah, it's, I, you know what, I, I, I completely relate. That's, that's exactly why I find It's funny that you should describe that while you were writing it, you felt he was with you because that's exactly how I felt about my, about my grandparents when I was, I was writing it as well. Um, now, we're actually running close, close to out of time, but there's one, one thing that I really wanted to ask you about. And one, one thing that really struck me about the book were, were the resonances it had with, with contemporary times. Like it's a book about a time and a place and particular people. And it's, it's actually, you know, I, I, I loved hearing you describe it just then because um, it really does really like a love letter to your dad. It's, it's, it's beautiful. Right. And, and he just comes across as such a, you know, a complex, but, but beautiful man. Right. Um, but the other thing, like 
beyond the, all those aspects to it, there's, there's, there are parts of it that really, um, you know, I don't know, mirrored contemporary concerns uh, to do with like, the the British anti-Semitism, like so, so you've got that you had the the all, all the the stuff that you know about in, in Germany and the occupied lands, and that, but like the, the, that aspect about um about xenophobia and its impact on refugee um like policy and action, um and I thought that really, to me, was almost a major lesson from the book. Yeah, I mean, it made me very angry actually the global anti-semitism not just british here in australia as well you know there we think of it as being unique to nazi germany but there there was a fear that the jews were going to recolonize countries and and you know take over the world or whatever and it makes me very cross that my father could have had his parents with him you know they didn't have to just save my dad. They wanted to save these children, convert them to Christianity, and then they actually wanted to send them back. You know, he, he was he had to pay. They paid a uh, fifty pounds, which uh, he never saw again, which was supposed supposedly to resettle you. You couldn't get into England unless you paid that fifty pound resettlement, which went into a some mysterious government bank account and was supposed to be used to resettle you after the war. So they weren't really opening their arms at all, um, and and children could not come with their parents. Children were separated from their parents. Most of those children lost their parents and became orphans, and this was not unique to Britain. As I say, this happened here. This happened. Yep. In America, this happened in China, all the places that took refugees, Jewish refugee children in, separated them from their parents. And it has clanging, clanging similarities with what is going on at the moment. Um, it feels like we have learned nothing about refugee policy and about how to treat refugees. Um, it was actually something my father was really, really interested in and really supported. He hated um, refugee policy that stopped people from being able to resettle. He, he felt that it was every, everyone's right to go to another country and resettle. For safety. They were going to pay their taxes and contribute. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, yeah, this, this idea that we're separating people when we think of Man Asylum, when we think of what we do here, in Australia, when we think of what Donald Trump is doing, you know, it, it is really chilling that we are definitely, we haven't learned. And we always say, you know, never forget about Nazi Germany. It's never forget about the refugee policy, you know, the, the yeah. courts were full of, I, I went through all, all of <coughs> the refugee policy discussions in parliament and they were so fearful that Jews were going to flood into Britain and set up an alternative state. It was, it's really shocking stuff to read. Um, another question. Um, do you harbour any, um, I'll, I'll, I'll paraphrase, do you, do you, do you harbour any resentment towards your grandparents on your, kind of on your, on your father's behalf? Um, so just to, to clarify, there's, there's some confusion in some of the comments that your grandmother did come and visit your, your, your father um, uh, after the war, um, but after your father's father had died, I believe? So what happened was it was very difficult for my grandparents because they were in, in Czechoslovakia. So they had a small window. They came out of Theresienstadt. My understanding now, I didn't know this growing up, was that they were uh, very sick and my, my grandfather had to go off to uh, a clinic to recuperate. My grandmother was, was, had very serious health concerns um, that I think were to do with her heart. Um, obviously, they had lived in, in a concentration camp. It, it was never going to be good. Um, and they'd lost everything, you know, they'd lost their jobs, their property was seized, their money was taken away. You know, they were, they were a well-to-do couple and they had nothing when they came back and had to rebuild. They couldn't send money to my father to help with his, his life and his education. We always, as a family, felt badly for my dad that his parents didn't come back. And that was something that was um, 
that was spread by my mother. My mother couldn't understand, firstly, how Helena could have let her child go to the other side of the world, well, not, you know, to England yeah. on, on his own. Um, you know, now I can tell her she, they had no choice, um, but yeah. my mother didn't know that. And then that Helena as a mother didn't want to come and get her only child um, after the war. Um, but reading the letters, I can see that they, A, didn't have the money, and B, were very sick. And then communism came in, and the Iron Curtain came down. To get out was, in, yeah. They couldn't get out, you know. My father didn't have a passport. So, um, you know, he was in no man's land. He was in a really difficult situation. And when we were growing up, um, I always wanted to, to go to Czechoslovakia to see my parents not sorry my grandparents and yeah. um, my father was so scared of going to Czechoslovakia yeah. because he thought he wouldn't be let out again and uh he, he there was no way he was going to go there so he didn't go until after the velvet revolution of course his mother had died by then but she came over in 1965 which was as soon as her husband died um so as, as soon as Rudolf died she came over to see my dad and my dad tried really hard to get her to come to live in England and the authorities wouldn't give her a visa. So this was her only child. She had no husband now. He was all alone in Prague and uh, the British government wouldn't allow her to come in. Um, this, is, this is actually, this is a very interesting question uh, again from, uh, from someone watching. Um, has this, has, has, going through this journey, learning what you've learned, changed the way, uh, your, your own sense of identity? Yes, I think it has. You know, a lot of people have asked me whether I feel Jewish now. I wasn't raised Jewish. My father wasn't raised Jewish. <laughs> either. Um, and I don't, I don't feel Jewish as such, although I do feel connected to the right. Jewish global family. But mostly what I feel connected to is, is the Holocaust. And I feel that that story is, is part of my story. And, and, I, and I can't erase that. And that does live with me all the time. And I've, pro I've created you know, these, these people who I'm desperate to know and who, who do sort of live with me as, as I go through life. And you, just to, just this will this will be I think have to be the, my, my last question. But um, you also did find a couple of people who are family. So what's it like now having family? Well, it's interesting because I found them. They're not exact. They're not blood family. Um, so they're from my um, my great great uncle's wife's children, and the wife was not part of my bloodline. We, we call that Tuchus Mishpucha. It's, a, you know, it's, it's as good as brother and sister. Okay, right. <laughs> <laughs> but they were very generous. One in Israel, one in, in Chicago. And um, interestingly, they're cousins and they don't talk. And um, I, I, it was difficult talking to them because again, I came across this not wanting to say stuff. And then they started to tell me some of their stories and they, they were uh, horrific and, and extraordinary. And then I researched their stories for them and found out things about them that they didn't know. And I think they found that quite difficult. So one, Ben has, uh, has sent me pictures of his newborn child and considers me family now. Rami, I haven't heard from. So I like that, that, that you, you get a Jewish family and straight away you get a Bruegus, like a, a disagreement. Yeah. Uh, anyway, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll have to leave it at that. But thank you so much for this chat. Thank you to everyone who joined. Um, uh, we had a good uh, 200 people. Um, and, you know, thank you for your questions. Um, and, and Juliet, thank you so much. And congratulations on this excellent book. If, if, uh, if people haven't read it, you really should. It's, it's just... You know, as we said, it's it's moving. It's 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 painful to read at times, but it, it you know it's 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 just it's really a beautiful um, uh, tribute to your father. Um, and and you know, congratulations on 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 all that you've achieved with it. And thank you so much for joining us. And uh, I will throw back to Nick. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Juliet and Bram. What a wonderful way to kick off our, our book club. Um, and, and Juliet, such eloquent responses to such great questions, both from Bram and from the people watching. So thank you again very much. Um, before you all log off, I just want to let you know what we've got coming up for the rest of the year. Next month, second Tuesday of the month, of course, we have uh, Paul Valente in conversation with Rachel Cohen on the uh, enigma of violence and its relationship to love. Uh, this was scheduled for our festival in May, so I'm delighted we're still able to feature it. Um, in October, we've lined up the um, African-American rabbi, uh, Shai Rishon, also known as Ma Nistana, uh, live from USA with, uh, with an indigenous writer. Still, we've still got to confirm. We'll let you know as soon as possible. Uh, confirmed. It's confirmed, Claire Coleman. Fantastic. You heard it first. Um, a Black Lives Matter um, special. Uh, well, there will, that session will be moderated by uh, Alyssa Goldstein. In November, uh, Alyssa will be back again, uh, this time with, with Tally Lovey and Bram again, to give you a, um, a summer reading guide. They're rec be recommending books for you to read over summer. Um, uh, and our next book club is next February, and it'll be Arnold Zabel on, on the water mill. So you've got plenty of time to start reading Arnold's book if you haven't already. And, and just one other thing you could start preparing. Um, our March event is going to be uh, an open mic event. It's going to be something quite special where you will have the opportunity to read out a piece of your own work, whether it be a poem, part of a memoir, uh, a piece of fiction. If you haven't got anything, by all means, start thinking and writing about it now. You've got several months, but um, you'll hear more and more about that. But I wanted to open the uh, Melbourne Jewish Book Week up to everybody to participate in so many different ways. Um, the best way to keep up with our events is to go to our website, or subscribe to our newsletter. Uh, and finally, if you enjoyed this evening, if it, if it took your mind off COVID-19 and lockdown, um, how much is it worth to have your mind taken off the, uh, <laughs> the COVID-19 world we live in? However much you thought it was worth, um, please go and donate. We, um, we are presenting these events uh, to you for, for, for free, and we want to continue to be to do so, but we do rely on, on donations. So um, uh, any donation gratefully received, obviously. Thank you again, all of you for tonight, and um, we'll see you again on the um, second Tuesday of next month and every month from there on. Thank you again, everybody. Good night.